Hi everyone, I'm Shiri Asenkat again, and welcome to our panel on research in accessible XR. I have three wonderful researchers joining us today, so I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. Uh, Amy, let's go ahead and start with you. Thanks, Shiri. Hi, I'm Amy Pavel. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in Carnegie Mellon University's Human Computer Interaction Institute. In my research, I design and develop new augmented, or sorry, new uh, interactive techniques that use artificial intelligence. And most recently, I've focused on creating AI assisted tools to make media like augmented reality and videos more non visually accessible. Uh, Kyle, how about you? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Kyle Rector. I'm an assistant professor of computer science at the University of Iowa, and my research is in designing, developing, and evaluating technologies to enhance quality of life for people with visual impairments. I've focused in domains such as exercise and art, but most recently I've been trying to look into how to make virtual reality experiences more accessible. And Martez. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Martez Mott. I'm a senior researcher in the Ability Group at Microsoft Research. And in my research, I try to create new ways for people with physical disabilities to have accessible interactions with the different types of computing devices they may have. And recently, I've been trying to better understand how we can make augmented and virtual reality systems more accessible to people with limited mobility. Great, thank you. So I wanted to get started by just asking each of you to tell us about the work that you've been doing in this area of XR accessibility. Uh, so what are some of the research questions that you've approached and uh, what are some of your key findings? So um, Amy, why don't we start with you again? Sure. So my most recent project was working with a team on how to make augmented reality applications more accessible to people who use screen readers. And a couple of the research questions here were what interactions um, are on AR applications currently that might be inaccessible. And so we covered, we covered domains like games, retail, and education. And then we wanted to know how we could make these interactions screen reader accessible. So to answer these two questions, we surveyed some of the most common interactions available on augmented reality applications today. Um, and then we developed application prototypes uh, that enabled uh, common interactions like searching for digital content in AR scenes and gaining more information about content in a scene. So for instance, imagine you're using an augmented reality museum app. You might click on an artifact to get more information about its history and where it came from. And then the second project that I've worked on recently that's related to this is trying to make 360 videos um, accessible without moving so much around to see all of the content. So one key question here where what are the important points in 360 video and can we reorient those points to be in front of the viewer rather than the viewer having to manually search around to find them themselves? Okay, great. Thanks, Amy. Um, Kyle, how about you? Sure. Yeah, so a recent research product I've worked on is in specifically VR gaming. I stumbled into VR actually during this. So I was at a sports camp for people with visual impairments, and I noticed this game people were playing called Showdown, which is like air hockey, except that you're wearing blinders and you're playing against an opponent still. But the key is you're listening to the ball. And I thought, what a cool game, and it's not that mainstream. And so what if we could implement something virtually in order to make the game come to life? And then we thought, well, virtual reality is a good avenue to start. And then we started investigating and realizing there's not a whole lot out there in terms of making virtual reality accessible to people with visual impairments. Specifically, if you're trying to track and interact with a moving object that you have to actually hit or touch or something like that. And so one of our key questions in our project was how to convey the sound of a moving object such that somebody can follow along with it in a game and interact with it. And as we are working on it, we realized another key question is how to uh, scaffold or give hints to folks that are new to this kind of experience. And a secondary goal we had during this research as well, when we were implementing and evaluating this game, a virtual reality version of Showdown, where now you're hitting a virtual ball, is how people use their bodies to interact with the game. So um, you developed- we also had some, mm -hmm. 
you developed a virtual, a VR version of the real life game Showdown, right? Correct. Yes. It, can it, you it's say a modified version? <laughs> can you say a little bit about what the actual show, Showdown game involves? Absolutely. Yeah. So the actual Showdown game, uh, again, we can parallel it to air hockey, but it has some differences. So the table's a bit longer. It's a little bit um, thinner than an air hockey table. It also has a wooden wall surrounding the table in that if the ball runs along the edges, you can hear it pretty clearly. The ball's less likely to fly off the table. And you're holding a wooden bat, um, which maybe the size of the bat is about the size of a cell phone with a handle on it. And so you're trying to hit this ball that when you shake it, it sounds like a maraca. And um, you're basically hitting the ball back and forth against your opponent, trying to get it into a semicircle shaped goal next to your opponent. And so both of you are wearing blinders and listening for this ball, and you're trying to make sure it doesn't go into the goal next to you. And uh, one cool thing about the game that's different than air hockey is that if the ball becomes silent on the opponent's side, then you actually get a point because you've made it such that they can't hit it back to you. Um, yeah, so we ended up implementing a drill version of this game where balls were coming to the player and they were trying to hit the balls back to the opponent to see how well that would work. Okay, makes sense. And then I cut you off. What were you going to say? Was there another part to the project? Oh, yeah, just some key findings. We've, uh, we actually tried two different ways of scaffolding folks, whether verbal hints or adding some aspects of vibration. We found the verbal was ideal for those who had played the real showdown game, because in the real world, the only vibrations you'd be feeling are in the gameplay itself, like feeling the vibrations of the ball and not necessarily in hint form. Um, but I can talk more about that later as well. Okay, so it sounds like both of you, Amy and Kyle, your focus in one way or another was on making AR or VR accessible to people with visual disabilities, with visual impairments, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Okay, Martez, how, how about your projects? Yeah, so one of the first projects we did was to actually just, you know, to get a better understanding of what challenges people with physical disabilities have encountered or might encounter when they're using different types of VR systems. So what we did was we conducted kind of a, a mixed, you know, in-person remote study where we actually had people try out different types of VR applications and then elicited feedback on you know, what worked well, what didn't work, what could be improved, if they could, you know, change anything, what would they like to change? And what we were able to find from that is, you know, essentially this kind of like set of different barriers that we identified that might prevent people from being able to engage in these different types of VR systems. And from that study, we've been able to kind of set our research agenda based off these kind of empirical results, based off the challenges that people actually have encountered and might encounter um, when they're using different types of VR systems. That's really interesting. So your work was focusing on people with physical disabilities. Can you give some examples of what kinds of disabilities that was? Yeah, so we had people um, with um, like cerebral palsy, people with muscular dystrophy, um, um, people with multiple sclerosis. Um, and I think some of the different, you know, people with physical disabilities, they, you know, even though somebody may have the same condition, for example, people have a wide range of different abilities that they might exhibit. So you might um, do a, you know, interview 10 people with cerebral palsy, but um, everyone is still going to have different abilities that are going to come to bear when you're thinking about understanding how to make these systems more accessible. So I think it's really important, and I'm pretty sure that's, you know, uh, kind of preaching to the choir here with the people attending this, but, you know, it's really important to be able to elicit as many different types of feedback from people as possible because you get just such a wide range of um, different experiences. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, that sounds a whole lot more complicated in some ways than just considering people who can't see, you know, who don't have any vision. Um, so what, what were some of the barriers to using VR that you found in the study? 
Yeah, so most of the barriers that we identified all had to do with the kind of physical aspects of VR hardware. So there are some things that we identified, like just setting up a VR system, for example, can be a big challenge, especially if somebody's thinking about doing this independently. So if you've ever set up like a VR system before, one of the first things you have to do is like set up this kind of like barrier. So like, you know, or this um, the interactive area that you might be playing inside. But, you know, that could pose challenges for people. So for example, one of the first things you might have to do is to like, set the floor level. But to do this, the system might require you to take your controller and actually tap the floor with it. Um, but that could be a challenge for people who have difficulty bending down or bending over. If you're a person who's inside of a power chair, for example, you might have difficulty reaching your arm to the ground to touch the floor. So that could pose a challenge. Um, just putting on a VR head mounted display, so the HMD, that could be a challenge You know, for people who may have difficulty lifting their arms above their chest, for example. Um, um, the systems themselves require you to kind of tighten them on top of your head in a certain type of way, so that can be challenging. And then there's also different challenges people might encounter when using kind of the VR controllers themselves. So, you know, I think there's a push now towards more kind of like hand tracking that you might get, but that can be, you know, challenging for people who may not be able to articulate their individual fingers. And then other people may have challenges holding the controllers, um, pushing button on the controllers, using two controllers at the same time. Um, so all of these different you know, problems could pop up. And right now we don't have really great mechanisms in place to be able to come up with alternative solutions if and when somebody does encounter one of these challenges. Yeah, yeah, it seems like there's so many more ways to like physically manipulate these systems now than, you know, just like the standard mouse or even just a mouse and a touchpad. Um, so yeah. each of you, it seems are working on very different VR or AR setups um, in terms of the hardware that's required to um, to use to interact with the environments. So, I mean, we all have the same goal here ultimately, and that's to make VR and AR platforms in general accessible. Um, but I'm wondering if you can describe your specific setup in a little more detail, just so that we have a better sense of what exactly you were dealing with. So Amy, maybe we can go back and start with you again. Sure, so yeah, the specific setup I was dealing with was uh, mobile augmented reality. So we focused on the setup because already we have a lot of mobile augmented reality applications. So I think a classic example of this is um, the IKEA application or the measure application, and it's difficult to make use of those right now um, if you use a screen reader. Um, so this is so that's the setup we picked first is mobile AR, but I think some of the ideas might eventually generalize to AR with things like headsets as well. Yeah, so by mobile AR, you mean uh, AR applications that are available today on like smartphone devices like the iPhone. Exactly, smartphones or iPads would work. Yeah, right, right. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, and that's very practical and kind of very necessary for, you know, the, the more immediate future, like the coming few years. Yes. Uh, Kyle, what about you? It sounded like you had a very different setup. <laughs> yes. And you were looking yes. at so, VR, right? Not AR. <laughs> correct. Correct. And non-visual VR at that. So that's related to my setup. In fact, um, the first thing that crossed my mind was, this game is intentionally non-visual and we ought to see how to make non-visual experiences just as, I guess, equitable access as visual. And so why need a headset at all? And so in fact, my setup, I used um, Unity to tie everything together, the software. And I had a Microsoft Connect about six feet away from the person on a table and they were standing at the other end playing at a physical table. And we also had just over the ear headphones where we deliver the audio. And also I wanted to give a haptic experience. So I had their like playing hand or dominant hand holding a Nintendo Switch Joy-Con in which would have high definition rumble so they could feel vibrations. But in this way, we were able to sense the body, give appropriate feedback to them based on their head and their hands and, and how they're facing all without needing a headset. So Kyle, do you think that what you're finding and your design of the game itself could be easily applicable to a like kind of a standard off-the-shelf headset VR system? 
or do you think this is more of like a future scenario where um, we might be using VR in different contexts? So I actually can imagine answering yes to both things you said. So first of all, well, Showdown specifically is not visual. And so sure, you can put it on a headset because headsets have headphones and everything. So you can certainly play the game while having that challenge but not be able to see the play space. But I also feel like it'd be really cool if uh, virtual reality products could be more modular. So maybe you have the visual module, but maybe you don't need the visual module and you can remove that and you can still have the audio and, uh, and not have it be like you have to have all the different, um, different, I guess, sensory outputs at one time, depending on your preferences or abilities. Uh, so I think also I am thinking about like further in the future as well. Yeah, and I think it's really important uh, at this time to be thinking about different VR setups. I mean, where there's no reason to feel locked into any of the commercial devices that are available today, like this technology is evolving very quickly. Um, Martez, what about you? your work yeah so for the work we've done so far has been primarily looking at commercial vr hardware so off the shelf kind of vr systems that you might get from htc or oculus and i think you know although our investigations so far have focused primarily on virtual reality we think that our findings can be more generalizable to any type of you know xr system that requires you know, handheld controllers um, with, you know, these kind of six degrees of freedom, anything that requires an HMD, especially if the person has to kind of equip and unequip it for the different type of experience. So that's been our primary focus so far, but we hope in the future to be able to expand these investigations a little bit to understand kind of what different new types of hardware we might be able to create because the current generation of VR hardware poses some significant accessibility challenges. And I think it's, reasonable to expect that we're going to have to do a lot of work to make those the, the physical hardware itself more accessible to people. Yeah, yeah, and that kind of goes along with what Kyle was saying about making the VR setup more modular. So maybe, uh, you know, in a few years, we'll be able to substitute one controller for another so that with with different headsets so that people can use whatever uh, hardware is is more suitable to their, their needs or to their abilities. Uh, going back to like the actual substance of the projects, could you talk a little bit about what were some of the key challenges that you each faced? Uh, Amy, maybe we can go back and start with you again. Sure. So I think the main thing that separates uh, AR applications from VR applications is that you have both uh, physical and digital content um, that you might need to represent. So for instance, in a VR application, uh, imagine you're placing furniture in a VR world, you might be able to have the developer define a lot of characteristics about the world and how it should be represented with a screen reader. On the other hand, in AR, you might be messy. Uh, you might be using like messy environments, and uh, you need computer vision uh, to be able to assess what's in the physical world and represent it uh, using something like a screen reader. So for instance, one one thing that we faced is when you're placing furniture in a room. So say I go to place a couch in my living room, um, it's really difficult to determine what in the physical space we should represent to the user. So for instance, if they go to place a couch, we could tell them, oh, the, you're placing the couch uh, next to the desk. But should we also represent, um, you know, maybe clutter that's around or artwork on the wall? Um, so I think, figuring out uh, how to recognize what's in the physical environment and then how to represent that um, in a summarized, condensed way that's actually useful to the user is like a major challenge in building um, screen reader accessible AR applications. Did you actually go ahead and make this type of application accessible to people who don't have vision? <laughs> Yes, and um, we had a quite uh, a simplified um, scenario. So for instance, uh, you could place a, uh, we developed a couple different prototypes on how you could uh, place or search for content in the scene. Um, so for instance, you could place content on the scene by selecting a couple different options where you would like to place that content. So for instance, um, if you had a lamp to place, you could select on the table. So 
Uh, but this was manually coded for now. And um, I think the future work is to try to figure out how we could uh, recognize and create these applications kind of more automatically. So I guess uh, just to summarize, our two prototypes that we created was one for uh, furniture placement. And the second was actually for viewing some educational content. We had a solar system application as an example um, that you could view the different objects in the scene. OK, yeah, say a little bit more about this application um, uh, uh, for where you can place furniture just because I think it's an interesting example. Uh, and I want to make sure people have like a concrete understanding of why it was so difficult to make it accessible and how you actually did it. Um, so this is the kind of application that people can use uh, when they're like considering buying new furniture, or redecorating or something to get um, kind of a a simulation or a mock-up of what the room might look like, right, with the new furniture? Yes, that's correct. So you might want to, um, you can imagine, uh, just to state a little bit more about what visual attributes might be interesting when you are placing furniture. So some things could be the uh, visual and physical attributes. So some things could be the size of the furniture. Does the furniture fit in the space uh, provided, for instance? Um, and then you might mm -hmm. imagine also that the color or the texture related to other objects in the room might also be important. So we prototyped pretty simple versions of this application just to um, try out a couple different interactions. Uh, but so one example that I was talking about is like placing a lamp in the environment and it would give you a few options on where you could place it. So for instance, would you play, like to place it on the desk, on the table? Um, but it was kind of difficult to get more information about the visual aspects around the scene. So that's definitely an interesting area for future work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can imagine that you're also very dependent on <coughs> computer vision and uh, whatever state of like computer vision libraries you have available to you, right? Exactly. So there's two major parts of computer vision I think are important here. So one is like segmenting the 3D scenes. So for instance, um, where are the surfaces in the scene at all? And then the second part is how you can represent uh, the scene in more of a um, in more of a descriptive way. So for instance, um, we might have a really good recognizer for desks, but not for other types of um, things in your environment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think it's also interesting that a lot of the information that you wanna get under this sort of user experience, like for, you know, for a typically sighted user would be very yeah. uh, subjective, you know, so yes. figuring out what kind of information we're looking for and how we can convey that in a useful way um, that's accessible, uh, that allows yeah, the person, definitely. yeah, that and allows the person with a visual impairment to make a judgment call. It would be really interesting. Yeah, and I, I think you could find a couple interesting things to do here as well. Like maybe it could suggest a couple good placements or it could give you a summary of the information and find out where you want more depth about um, maybe like how well the color matches to something else in your room or what the uh, color itself is. So I think that there's kind of, a, you know, what information is important to you depending on what task you're doing can also change. So yeah, it's a, it's a super interesting and challenging problem. I think there's so much room for um, more development there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kyle, what about you? What were some of the key challenges? Yes, so at first we were thinking, well, how do we convey the ball sound? And so we had to toy a bit with how to play with audio. Uh, we ended up going with binaural sound for right to left and making it very discreetly clear um, based on the ear that you're hearing it, where is it with respect to you? And then also a further challenge was conveying the depth of the ball. And we eventually converged on a custom roll-off curve and doing some other audio effects to make uh, the ball on the opposite side of the table sound quieter than the closer side of the table. But once we got there, we realized there was a super key challenge, and that is having others try out this experience. So like the uh, student who worked with me on this, he's now at Microsoft, myself, we were able to pick up the game on our own pretty well. But when we had others kind of just try it out informally, we realized that it's not just making it work. That wasn't enough. It was about like, here's this bizarre new sound that you're hearing that doesn't sound like a ball, but in fact, it's like a, a wave. And the reason for that, that's easier to track when an object is moving than like a constant sound, we'll say the same exact pitch. But we had to give hints or scaffold um, more specifically 
scaffold players as they're playing the game. So we wanted to make this also enjoyable at the same time. So we had to figure out how to embed the hints during the gameplay and then slowly roll them off or um, remove them as they advanced in level, basically. So we had like these different levels based on the score that you got. And at first you heard really detailed hints and constructive feedback, and we slowly had to remove that. And so the challenge was how to allow people to pick up this new experience without um, any prior experience, of course, and in such a way that they're already able to play and then make it so that it becomes challenging enough later on. And so that was one of the big things that we dealt with in the design. Mm -hmm. uh, you've mentioned this word scaffold several times or hints, yeah. as you call them. Yes. But could you say a little mm -hmm. bit more about what exactly you mean by this? Yes. Yeah. So scaffolding is something that's used in education as well. And it's where you're you're providing uh, enough information as you're doing the activity. And that way it's kind of all built in. So in the example of our virtual reality game, we had um, some hints in advance where you kind of could hear where the ball starts and where it will end. And that was said verbally. So you could get used to the 3D audio in your headphones and like things getting louder as they get closer to you. And then um, as the ball crossed the halfway point, we paid attention to where your hand was currently. And we said whether you had to move your hand further to the right or to the left to hit the ball. And then finally, if you um, hit the ball, of course, you got cheer. And if you missed, then we'd give constructive verbal feedback in the form of saying how far your hand should have gone. Uh, sometimes we did it in like literal measurement. Other times we used metaphors like the length of a pen or something like that, or the length of your forearm. And so we have these three different ways of basically building that information into gameplay instead of just having like a tutorial beforehand and then here you go, play, good luck. Uh, so it's trying to immerse it or put it in all together at the same time. Mm. Do you think that the scaffolds are necessary for, um, let's say a future world where the audio simulations are going to be very, very realistic? Hmm. I see what you're saying. So if it was sounding like an actual ball and you could tell exactly where it is in space, would you need this scaffolding? Yeah. Uh, perha perhaps, well, perhaps not. Um, <laughs> I mean, if it sounds very realistic, then um, likely you'd be able to pick up on that faster, right? Um, I know at this time we d we tried using realistic sounds and that was not possible because it was really hard to tell where the ball was at a certain time. We actually tried like a ball rolling on wood and replaying that loop and it just didn't quite mm. work in terms of assessing its depth at this time. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it would be a very long time until uh, we'd be able to get to that point where, you know, it sounded just like a real ball. Um, mm -hmm. But that's really interesting because I think that this whole concept of scaffolding is going to be very important because uh, yes. You know, it's a relatively new platform. And then like we were talking about earlier, there are so many different setups for the platform that there's going to be learning curves for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, Martez, what were some of the key challenges that you faced in your work? Yeah, so it's been really difficult to try to understand the application level accessibility of some of these VR systems because you know the physical devices and the software are so tightly coupled. So if you have inaccessible hardware, it's really then really difficult to try to assess, well, what's the kind of overall accessibility of the platform because you can't really get past you know, this first part, which is, can people actually use the hardware that's required to interact with the software? So we've tried some type of investigations early on to get past this. So for example, one system or one kind of attempt that we tried to make with this was to try to understand, for example, how we could have more accessible by manual interactions in VR, but with like unimanual input. So if you kind of play any VR games or these applications, you might encounter something like, oh, now I have to like climb this ladder and I have to use kind of like two hands to perform like a climbing up motion. Or I get to this door or this like safe and I need to use like two hands to like turn this wheel to open a safe. Uh, but that could be a problem for people who might have less strength in one hemisphere of their body or a person who's an amputee and only wants to use one controller. So then there's this case of like, well, how do we get past some of these kind of 
software barriers if the hardware itself doesn't really allow us to do that. So there was some work that we did there to try to understand like how could we with like just a single controller input make you know it more accessible to have you know by manual interactions inside of VR applications. So that's been one kind of big challenge of just trying to understand how do we get past or overcome these hardware um, and accessibility barriers? And then I think the second, um, and especially this has been true over the last year and a half, which is when I kind of started doing this work, is that um, not many people with physical disabilities personally own a lot of VR you know, hardware, like VR headsets, these, you know, VR platforms. So it's really difficult to do co-design type of work, uh, which is what we would prefer to do and actually be able to work side by side with people. Due to COVID, we haven't able, been able to, you know, be in person to do any of this work. And there's also, you know, no opportunities or very little opportunities for us, for example, to kind of create some software or to create some prototypes and actually have people try them out in their homes because people just don't have the hardware. So it's really difficult to try to understand, you know, what kind of small tweaks we need to make because a lot of these things are based off perception, right? So we could build something, but if it doesn't really work for the people we're intending it to work for, you know, because they don't have the opportunity to actually try it, it really makes it difficult for us to actually understand what kind of like the efficacy of the things we're building are. So those have been two big challenges that we've been facing so far. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. And I know also from the work that I've done on making VR more accessible to people with visual disabilities, you're kind of starting out for this place of, well, it's not accessible at all and they don't use the technology at all. So it's hard to even figure out what the specific challenges are. <laughs> um, but you you raised a really good point, Martez, in that you wanted to do co-design with people with disabilities to involve them in the design process itself. And I know the work that all three of you do, and I know that that's a priority for all of you. Uh, so I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about your methods and how you involve people with disabilities in, well, how you involve them in this work in particular that we've been discussing. Um, Amy, maybe we could go back to you. Sure. So for every project, I, I take a slightly different approach, but I would say for this, um, for the AR project specifically, I we essentially surveyed the applications that were already out there and used um, guidelines on what types of things you might want to do with these applications in order to create a taxonomy of um, the possible interactions that might be inaccessible. And then uh, because all of all of it was inaccessible, we involved uh, blind users at the time that we created a few different variations of prototypes so that we could get some early stage feedback on what what are the advantages and disadvantages of these different variations of our prototype? And then how could those inform what we do in the future for how we can make um, better prototypes going forward. In other types of projects, I might involve um, users with disabilities a little bit earlier so that we can get um, more feedback as well, um, even, even in an earlier stage than that. But at this, in this specific project, it was at the stage of comparing a few possible prototypes for just making the base level of these AR applications more accessible. Yeah, yeah, that kind of um, dovetails on what I was just saying that, you know, it's hard to it, we'd like to involve people very early on in just figuring out what the challenges are that they're currently experiencing. Yeah. But right now, it's, well, I can't use this. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> it's, it's starting yeah. from basic zero, unfortunately. And I guess, you know, ways that people people might have other ways to get around it still. And I think that might be interesting to look at in the future. So for instance, maybe um, you have your sighted partner help you with parts of the application that you're unable to um, do right now. So I think there's still ways that people work around using these applications that could be informative. Um, and so definitely probably worth exploring in the future too. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, Kyle, what about you? Yes, yeah, so in this particular project, um, the whole conception of the idea came from, I guess, immersing myself and going to events like a sports camp for people with visual impairments and just observing because it's like a whole new world for me. And uh, so that was the motivation. And then I guess over the time of the design process, I did get kind of very informal feedback like play this out, let me know what you think, um, not systematic or fancy in any way. 
but um, that was actually what gave me the idea of the scaffolding because it was clear that some people got it right away good and others were not even sure how to get started and so that's when I was like we need to scaffold them and I wouldn't have thought of that if I hadn't had people informally try it out and talk to me about it and then of course I did the official user studies with um, people and doing you know procedures and all that data collection and everything and the findings from that uh, like one interesting tidbit that I definitely want to follow up on now in the future is People kind of were playing, you know, with forehand or backhand swings, but then also people were doing other techniques like jousting at the ball, like poking at it or just holding the hand stationary. And so then that interaction actually will inform future research. So when I start um, thinking about how to inter how to use your body to interact with a moving object, not just to hit it, but like, how do you hit it? So when I start on that, now I've already had some valuable conversations through my formal research to keep going. And more generally in my research, I love to interview people. It's like one of my favorite things to do um, in addition to building stuff and testing it. And so I've done um, interview study before or um, embedding an interview early on in the project, talking to people informally as I go, just to make sure I'm on the right track. And then by the time I'm officially testing, I, I have some level of confidence in, in what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. I think what you mentioned about talking to people informally, that's something that I try to emphasize with my students all the time, like that level of just immersing yourself in the community and doing all of this informal work is so important, even though it's not necessarily something that, you know, we as researchers can write up in our papers and get, you know, credit for <laughs> in that way. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I remember even in graduate school, I um, volunteered at various things in the state of Washington where I was. And it was just as rewarding as it was helpful for my research. Just, just a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we only have a few more minutes before um, going into Q and A, but I wanted to ask each of you, what are some of the more general challenges, um, the pressing challenges that you see for the field of making XR accessible moving forward? So um, Amy, what do you think? Yeah, so I think there's sort of three main challenges that I've been thinking about. So one is this, how do we represent the physical world and its interactions with our digital content, um, knowing that we will likely need to use uh, computer vision algorithms to recognize and then summarize the content in the scene. And so I think there's a lot of interaction as well as deep computer vision questions there. Um, the second main challenge is that, uh, at least in, in my experience, augmented reality can be uh, not accessible because you also also need to move around a lot. So similar to uh, Mar well, Martez's project, if you uh, a lot of AR applications require walking or moving your camera, like very using fine grain motion to move your camera around the scene. So I think um, you know working on how we can make AR more accessible to people with mobility impairments will be really important. And then a third thing is that oftentimes right now we're designing um, these applications uh, to be accessible after some of them are already designed, and I think. Kyle's uh, Kyle's project is a really great example of making a um, accessible first uh, application. But I think in the future, more applications could uh, think about accessibility from the very beginning, involve people in their design process, and maybe come up with even better solutions um, than we have today for uh, for you know after the fact accessibility improvements. Kyle, how about you? What are some of the pressing challenges for the field of XR accessibility moving forward? Absolutely. Yeah, thinking about, I guess, sound for a second, I was using sound such that you could actually play something, but there's sound also that's meant for immersiveness, also realism. I guess those are one and the same, but for entertainment. And so how do you blend all those sounds together so that way you can use it, but also enjoy it fully and have a realistic experience like you do when you hear things in the real world? So that's one thing. Another thing I found interesting um, and this was based on an interaction I had, a person was actually relieved that the VR game had no headset because they were prone to seizures. And it was something I hadn't even considered when I was building this. And now it's apparent to me that it's not just, you know, one class of disability, although that's how I often do my work, but we have to think of comorbidities that people aren't just gonna necessarily have one disability, or maybe it's a hidden disability. And, and so we're actually generalizing much 
broader than maybe that target audience we're thinking of. But people with comorbidities could have even more valuable insights um, that you hadn't considered prior. So that was helpful for me. And I guess that ties back into this whole modular thing. And um, yeah, so I appreciate what uh, Martez is doing as well with the uh, to give different controllers, like what are all the different pieces that you need to make an inclusive uh, VR experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And also just the fact that, you know, it, it's, it's easier for us to put people in buckets different categories, but ultimately there's so much more variation, you know, within each of these categories that it's very challenging to account for. Uh, Martez, what are some of the pressing challenges for the field moving forward? Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest challenges I've identified so far has been, you know, we really need to broaden our perception of what we think some of these technologies should be. I think one of the kind of more frustrating experiences I've had talking to people is that, you know, content creators, application developers might have a very specific ideal for what they want their VR experience to look like. So, you know, they want it to feel so realistic and they want it, you know, your physical motions to actually feel like you've been transported to these different places and they, they really want this sense of embodiment and immersion. And that can be all well and good in some instances, but I think what we end up doing is that we, by going through that approach, what we end up doing is actually importing some of the inaccessibility of the physical world into the virtual world. And we don't need to. And that makes it really difficult when we then try to develop new types of methods or techniques to improve the accessibility of VR because we're so tightly integrating what we think these VR environments should be based off what our physical lives are like. So we really want kind of like, you know, this immersion of embodying avatars and for it to really be lifelike, but we're not giving also room for people or for us to understand how can we create more accessible experiences that allows people to be and exist in different ways and still have all of these great experiences in the VR world because we don't want people to feel that the physical world may present accessibility barriers to them and then also they find those same accessibility barriers in the virtual world. So I think we really need like as a field need to broaden our kind of you know conception of what VR and AR technologies really should be um, in a lot of these different instances. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, and that's also something that um, we can try to do collectively as the XR Access Initiative uh, in terms of changing or broadening people's conception of what AR and VR should be. Um, and that, you know, obviously should take into account people's range of abilities. Uh, okay, great. Let's see if we have any questions from Slack. So, Jesse. Uh, what are you seeing there? <laughs> Do we have any questions? Oh, thank you, Shiri, Martez, Kyle, and Amy um, for that great talk. Uh, as a reminder, you can post questions to the panelists in the topic research channel on Slack. So I'm going to send this first question to Martez for the industry perspective, um, but would love to hear from others as well. So we have seen so much great work, yours included, um, in making XR accessible. What can researchers do, whether they are uh, independent at a university or in some other situation, to help get their findings put into practice by developers or platform or hardware companies so that end users end up benefiting? Or vice versa, how can companies benefit from this type of fundamental research? Uh, before, sorry, before Martez yeah. answers, let me just interject really quickly that that's one of the key goals of XR Access, right? To try and make sure that there's a line of communication and more translation of the research that we're doing. Okay, sorry, Martez. <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah, I was, yeah, I agree with Sherry's point. You know, I mean, that's been something for me that's been interesting as like a trained academic who's now in the kind of research and I mean, in the industry environment to understand how I can take, you know, the things that we may be doing in Microsoft Research and then, you know, try to share our findings, share our learnings with people and product teams so that they can best take advantage of that. And I think, you know, sometimes, you know, for example, I'll just use me as an example. I might naively say like, oh yeah, we wrote a paper on this here. Here's a link, go read my paper. And people might say like, okay, 
I don't have time or just don't want to kind of like read through this like 15 page paper you sent me, right? So there's also has to be this kind of property of kind of distilling down some of our findings and some of the work that we do into ways that, you know, it's more easily digestible for people because people on product teams are also have their own set of deadlines and their own set of requirements that they're trying to meet. And we need to make it as easy as possible, I think, for them to be able to kind of you know, consume what we're producing and and try to make that as useful as possible for them. So I would try, you know, things like, you know, XR access or other different types of forms to be able to kind of share the work in different ways, you know, be able to produce alternative writing. So not just like the paper, but if you could produce like a small blog post that's like, hey, here's a 500 word breakdown of this, you know, 10,000 word paper I just wrote, that might be a, a much easier way for people to be able to digest some of the findings, especially if you can produce it in a way like, hey, here's this 500 word blog, here's a link to our GitHub where we have some code online, take a look at this demo or something like that that and i think that can go a long way to helping people understand what's been going on in the research field yeah and we're also going to be looking at additional ways of just getting people together and giving short talks through xr access uh, to disseminate research to other interested parties great so stay tuned for that <laughs> So next question on Slack is for Amy. Um, you mentioned using uh, machine learning to uh, help create um, accessible experiences. Can you talk a little bit more about how you do that and what are the, some of the challenges, maybe pros and cons of using that kind of technology in your work? Yes, yeah, so um, it's challenging. Uh, so I guess one, um, Right now, a lot of the technology is quite limited. And so I guess a couple different types of limitations that I've run into are first, you know, regular problems that we're used to thinking about, like um, the accuracy of an algorithm. So if I say this is a table or if I say this is a floor, how accurate is that? Um, is that? And then another thing that I've run into is that sometimes the uh, descriptions that we could possibly recognize for something aren't yet adequate. So if we think about doing something like machine learning in your home, you might have um, personal objects or things that are kind of unique to you that you might want to describe in a different way uh, than what might be the default by the system. And this can be increasingly challenging if you're trying to describe something like uh, people who might have different identities they want represented differently in um, in the machine learning descriptions, or it can be challenging with um, you know objects in your room as well. And so I think you know uh, accuracy, the uh, training descriptions, so that they would actually be uh, relevant to you and not just um, and not just kind of quite generic, which sort of can happen right now. And then another third thing is the, you get a, back a lot of information. So say I was to recognize every object in your room. Uh, right now, that would be way too many objects to describe to you personally. So I think a really interesting um, challenge for the future is how we can allow end users to customize themselves, what types of uh, objects they would like to prioritize in descriptions and what types of objects are less interesting that, to them to be described. And so I think, a major challenge of machine learning going forward is making sure that end users actually have more access to informing what these techniques recognize about themselves and their environment and not just uh, creating all of that, um, trying to solve all of that on the side of the developer who might have quite specialized knowledge. So those are a couple of the challenges I could kind of think of so far. Great, thank you. Um, so we have Time for one more question. I'm going to send this to Shiri, but I'd love to hear from others as well. Um, and that is, how can we get students, whether at the undergraduate or graduate level, involved in XR design and research? How do we train that next generation of researchers? Ah, well, um, there are many ways to do this. I mean, it depon who the question is coming from. Do we do we mean like in a general sense, or specifically someone who's at a university or at a certain company? I think I think just in general, um, what are what are any sort of parts that are going on um, to sort of make sure that people have training to become knowledgeable in this area? Mm -hmm. um, so again, this is one of the goals of XR Access, and uh, I'll just plug that this uh, this summer and the next few summers we have funding to um, support summer undergraduates in a research experience on making XR accessible. So that's ongoing now. And then if you, 
if you have or know students who might be interested for next summer, we'll be advertising that when the time comes. Uh, so I think it's very important to introduce accessibility into the undergraduate and graduate, but especially undergraduate curriculum. So if you or someone you know has a class on XR, uh, then it's incredibly important to somehow make sure that the perspective of people with disabilities is represented, um, whether it's highlighting some of the research that we've been talking about here, or whether it's bringing a person with a disability to talk about some of the challenges that they experience when using a device. Um, I think that exposure and that uh, awareness is incredibly important and it's a starting point. You know, I, ideally I'd like to say that we should all be as as professors teaching classes on XR accessibility. Um, but there, you know, we need to do both. We need to focus on accessibility and we need to make sure that accessibility is incorporated in any design or development uh, or introductory class. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, so that's all the time we have for questions for the research panel. We would love to have you all continue the discussion on Slack, and I'm hoping that the panelists may be able to answer some additional specific questions about their work there as well, because we do have some of those coming up. So thank you again to Shiri, Amy, Martez, and Kyle. Um, now we're going to take a quick break, and we'll return in 10 minutes for the final panel of the day on building a diverse talent pipeline. <laughs>